Welcome back to the Cineposium Podcast. I'm Martin Ibarra Ramos. And I'm Alex Aposola. And thank you all for joining us again for this week's episode. In case you missed last week's episode curated by Alex, we discussed Videodrome. And I was sad to uh, miss out on that conversation last week. Unfortunately, I had to step out. But uh, there was a really great and insightful conversation um, that really gets into how layered that film is. And it has me all the more intrigued to see it. I've actually not yet seen the film myself. And so... You know, highly recommend uh, to everyone to check out the episode and watch the film because I think it's going to be a great watch. And uh, now to shift gears to this week, um, Alex, why don't you let them know how the show works? Sure. So every week we're inviting members or collaborators of Cineposium to curate a film for us for remote viewing. And we're going to be having a conversation about that film here on the podcast. Uh, new episodes of the podcast are going to be published every Thursday and various members of Cineposium are going to be on here to discuss usually the film. Uh, this week it is just me and Martin, um, and Martin is doing our curation for us. Uh, talk about having like two layered films back to back. Last week with Videodrome, and this week with La Llorona. Thank you, Alex. Yes, I am um, very excited to present Jairo Bustamante's film La Llorona um, for this week's episode. It's a film that I've been anticipating quite heavily since since hearing of it uh, many months ago. Actually, Alex, I think you may have been the one to tell me about the film. And I was all the more excited to hear of its scheduled release on Shudder uh, for the week before this episode, my episode for the podcast, because I was planning for a different film. But as soon as I heard that I was going to be able to watch this in time, I thought, OK, no, let's do this because um, it's right into um, some of the research areas that I'm very interested in, in terms of you know, horror cinema, you know, geared toward representation of, of traditions and of folk tales and how those are used to, to really get into deeper thematic issues. And so this this film is right up my alley uh, in terms of research and also just in terms of I'm realizing the kinds of films that I'm really growing more and more fond of and more interested in watching and rewatching and studying. And so, um, you know, this this is in particular a very complex and profound film it, it as i said it uses horror and folklore to you know tackle very real events in in guatemala's history uh, namely the genocide of indigenous communities and um so I, I honestly i'd really like to get right into the conversation because uh you know there is r- truly a lot to tackle and alex and i are going to do our best to to get into as much of it as we can um there's um, honestly so much to tackle, though, that I'll just say there could probably be, uh, you know, uh, an entire podcast show dedicated to this kind of study or at least multiple episodes. So there's a chance we might, um, you know, release multiple episodes on this. We're going to we're going to see what we do in that way. But um, for now, we'll get started. So um, we'll get started with reactions, I think, just to kind of, you know, lead into our conversation here. Um, I'll start just to keep the kind of flow here. Um, so. I honestly was just incredibly moved by this film um, and and enthralled by it. Uh, I had high expectations going in because I understood how Jairo Bustamante was was utilizing the the folktale of La Llorona um, a bit differently, and and my my studies in folk horror have um, often well mostly been put to understanding you know how how filmmakers can use folk tales and traditions and um and things to i guess make make something more cinematic but more importantly to um highlight and um comment on real human issues and you know um how certain areas of the world have their own ways of life and um you know their own histories and i think this film does an incredible job of that and it's it's really not like anything I've seen in terms of storytelling through La Llorona. It's 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 quite a varied um, adaptation, if if I can use that word. And and we'll get into that um, a little bit later. But I, I just want to say I'm I'm I genuinely love how it was used in in, in this film in this way. Um, you know, it's it's incredibly um, experiential of uh, of a film. The, the way the film's crafted, I honestly I was in awe of um and it's a slow build which I really appreciated I, I actually usually enjoy slow builds I know that that's kind of a controversial thing to say I think there are a lot of people that might find 
um, you know, might have trouble with with slower films, but I think that it's absolutely appropriate and I think really aids to what Bustamante is doing with this film. Um, and so, I mean, I don't know. There's a lot I can say, but my immediate reaction was just I, I loved it. Um, I, w- I watched it pretty late, but I honestly um, couldn't take my eyes off of it and watched it again right before this podcast and loved it even more. So uh, before saying anything more, Alex, what did you think of Jairo Bustamante's La Llorona? Yeah, so there was this, this was a film that like I had heard about um, last year. <laughs> so after the um, 2019 Michael Chavez Curse of La Llorona that had come out um, and been like this huge like box office flop, considering uh, that it was part of the Conjuring universe, uh, I I didn't like that. I d- I didn't like that film. Honestly, I didn't like that film. And so I, I was looking for um, like different adaptations of this story because um i think around the same time as the as the curse of la neurona had come out um buzzfeed unsolved had done an episode about um la neurona and had gone to uh like the river mexico where she supposedly um originated and and so like i was like really interested in this and then i found out um that i think it was at the toronto international film festival um, it was screened as part of um, the world cinema category and it started generating like a lot of, of interest and a lot of hype. Um, and I'd kind of like given up hope of ever being able to see this film, honestly, because like it was just, it was, you know, uh, a lot of films that like go into TIFF, especially in the international categories, never quite make it to US releases. Um, and if they do, they're very hard to get a hold of. Um, so honestly, like shout out to Shutter for like having it advertising it very well and then actually making it very easy and accessible to watch um and honestly like i figured that you know for a film going into a film festival there's always a lot of hype um and i would have thought that the hype would be you know just overdone you know very much misplaced going into this film it deserved every single bit of the hype i think that currently the film has like a hundred percent on rotten tomatoes or something outrageous like that and honestly deserves every single every single percent, every single bit of praise. Um, it is very slow, uh, like you had said, but that seems to be the the trend right now for, for horror, especially horror that is attempting to do something more than just scare the audience. Um, and this film in particular is very much invested in doing a lot more than just scaring. Um, I feel like this is probably one of those films that only comes around like every 10 20 years and it's just incredibly significant and for some reason no one's heard of it um and that's like honestly a shame so i'm I'm glad that we get to cover it on the podcast because like this is i feel like probably one of the most impactful pieces of film media that i've seen recently um and it's just so grounded in reality and pain and like cultural preservation that like i i feel like this is just a very significant film yeah, I have to agree that um, one thing that I'm I'm just very happy about is the fact that well, hopefully we can we can put more attention to this film and more eyes on this film because um, I have to agree entirely. It's it's one of the more profound films I've seen in a long time and one that I'll be continuously studying and thinking about for a long time and rewatching because it it, it truly uh, does open your eyes up to a to a part of uh, history that. Um, truly does need more attention and um the way that Bustamante tackles all of that it's just it's in it's incredibly um interesting because you know in one in one angle you could look at it as it's it's fascinating to consider how he implicates the photo of La Llorona into this history but then there's other things as well and that and how he kind of tips the horror archetype if you will um sort of sideways and i feel like there are multiple ways in which he does that and that also um, really intrigued me and so uh, again we'll, we'll we're kind of touching on things that i think we'll talk about further um later on in the podcast but there are uh, a few areas that i think we really need to dive into um as we talk about this film and so first i would like to get into the historical context that is um, behind the film and is um i maybe not you know i guess you could say that maybe it's not entirely necessary to know but it certainly adds a lot more to your take for to an audience uh, member's takeaways from the film and and i mean once you know it i think um the film's impact is is much stronger 
Um, so I, I honestly haven't found anything that suggests, personally at least, I don't know if you have Alex, but I haven't found anything that suggests that Bustamante is, in, in which he has said directly, yes, this film is about the Guatemalan um, militant uh, general or dictator, um, Efrain Rios Mont. Uh, have you have you read anything or heard anything uh, as such as him specifically saying his name and saying, yes, this film is about him? I have not heard it from the director himself, um, but I've seen that connection being made in several different reviews um, that I read. And I'm not sure actually that he, like I, to me at least, it doesn't feel like he does need to say it. Like, I, I think that it's, I, yeah, it's like, I, I think that it's just obvious enough that it is about this, that like, I, you know, he doesn't need to say so. Um, so I, I wouldn't be surprised if he, if he never comes forward and is like, this is what the film's about, just because it's, it's just about that. I don't know that, you know, yeah, the apocalypse. Yeah. Once, once, once you start doing a bit of research on this history, um, it's pretty clear. But I just I was wondering if if he had actually in fact said said that himself. But no, um, yeah. So uh, first I'll say I mean yeah the the actor yeah Julio Diaz who plays Enrique the general in the film. Um, I mean first and foremost I'll just say he looks identical to um, Efrain Rios Mont. And so you know there's that's one element in itself. But I mean once you start understanding all the all the history and the facts behind it um, and what occurred. Um, in that in that part of Guatemala's history, you'll you'll understand that it's I mean it is about him. So to offer a bit of background on Rios Montt, he was a Guatemalan army general and politician who ruled Guatemala as a leader of a military junta and as a dictator from 1982 to 1983. Um, <clears throat> and he was among the most murderous of uh, you know of of commanders who essentially turned a lot of Central America into this just uh, field of, of killing and, and murder and, and, and yeah, and death. And he, w so he was convicted in 2013 of um, trying to exterminate the Ishil community, the Maya Ishil community of, of the larger Mayan India, uh, Indian community whose villages were, were wiped out by his forces. And so, you know, there's, there's um, quite a long timeline in terms of how his, uh, trials play out um within the timeline he he had moments of immunity from from trial um and in 2012 uh he was under house arrest and um indicted in march and after a trial of nearly two months he was convicted in may of having orchestrated um you know this this campaign that led to the deaths of hundreds of thousands of mile Ishil Indians and, you know, forced displacement of many, many more. Um, and, you know, uh, as well as having allowed crimes of torture and, and rape to be committed without or with impunity. Um, and, you know, uh, so there's there's more history to this, um, uh, to to Rios Mont in that, you know, he the the there's this constitutional court that annuls the conviction um, based on, I think it was I, what I read was like procedural irregu irregularities, and so as well as another thing that comes up is his health. As he gets older and as trials are sort of postponed and he has immunity, things are prolonged even further, and eventually he he dies in 2018 when the trial has just recently sort of reopened and was ongoing, and he was actually due to his declining health was um, not required to attend the proceedings, but eventually he dies, and so. Um, the film has a way of really tapping into events within that timeline that do happen. Um, and I think it's really interesting to consider the authenticity um, that the film maintains in trying to do that. And um, there's so there's there's something to, to talk about there. But Alex, do you have any more thoughts on the comparisons to or the um, representation of what took place um, with Efrain Rios Mont and his trials and how it, it's its involvement in the film. Yeah, so I I think I think the important thing is that um, while the film overlaps with the the trials of uh, Rios Mont for genocide, um, 
I, I think that I think that's also incredibly important to note that the film uh, doesn't exist in this post-genocide period. Um, it exists actively at some points, like during the genocide itself. Um, so the film has like this very interesting notion of time, and I, I think that that is something that um, is is part of almost like the soul of the film is that um, no, it's not like a forgive and forget kind of situation. It didn't happen that long ago. It's still actively happening, even if Rios Mont isn't the person who is perpetrating the violence. Um, and so, like, the, the racism just doesn't die with, with Rios Mont. Like, that's just not, that's just not what happens. Um, right. And, and, you know, the film's ending, I think, suggests that very much as well. But something, something that I really, that I read about and I really loved and I think is something again what I was hinting at before and in, in what Bustamante is doing with the horror genre that's d- a bit different and distinct is that he's placing the perspective on throughout or, or in the household with him and his family throughout the film. I think that's an interesting angle with which to view the narrative and experience the film. Um, and I, and I, I really love that approach to it because it, it kind of gets to what's going on with him internally um, and so I think that, that that perspective allows for us to also, or, or allows for, for Bustamante to um, maintain authenticity to, to, you know, what occurred at this, at this time um, in Guatemala, but also represent the um, cultures that are involved in the film, which are, there are various, and as, as well as various generations, um, which I think is also an interesting element of the film. Um, and so, you know, within the film, one one element that is, I think, significant, although maybe perhaps subtle, is um, the element of language. There are three uh, different languages that we get in the film. There is um, Spanish, there is the indigenous languages of Maya Ishil community, and the Maya Cochical, um community as well. Um, any thoughts on the use of language in the film, Alex? Yeah, so I, I think that's something that's um it was really stand out to me when it comes to like the language is um Bestamente's just absolute determination um to depict indigenous Maya languages and the use of them. Um and then to separate them out very specifically from Spanish. Um so the subtitles are built into the film. Um they're not an option, you cannot remove them. Um which makes me think that like the subtitles were not something that was um, like auto-generated or added later. I think that the subtitles were crafted kind of alongside the film from the international release. Um, and the way the subtitles function is that if you have um, two Spanish speakers in the same room uh, with a Maya person, um, the Spanish will be subtitled, the indigenous language never will be. Um, but if you have a room full of Maya speakers, then the subtitles will actually show you that language. Um, and I think that that's super interesting, um, cause it's kind of like using the language and the subtitles to kind of like depict this divide that is already very apparent in the film between, um, the Spanish and the Maya when it comes to just class, race, um, systematic oppressions they can only speak their own language in private and the two languages like never intersect and will often be working between translators and such. Um, I think one of the, the, the scenes that is most defining to me when it comes to that is, is the uh, courtroom scene uh, where the, the elderly woman is um, sharing her experience and testifying to the court of what she experienced as part of the genocide. Um, and she is speaking in her indigenous language and then being translated into Spanish by the, um, the court stenographer um, who is then reporting it back. Um, so even though she's like providing her testimony um, in Maya, she's not like, it's not her words. Like her words are being taken from her by that translator, uh, even in her own testimony of the atrocities that were committed against her. Yes, exactly, and and I think that gets into a larger point that I, that um, or larger thing that's going on with this film is the clash between classes, which, you know, is is um, explored in various ways throughout the film. Um, and I think yes, yeah, certainly you're correct. Language is is one of the ways that it's able to do that. Um, in terms of when we see the languages pop up, um, I, I think in the trial scene, it is the Maya Ishil uh, language. Um, and I read that. Bustamante chose for for that to happen in that way because the Maya Ishil people were the most affected during the genocide. 
um, the other language, um, Maya Kakchikel, uh, is, is spoken in the home. And um, it's used because Bustamante himself grew up in a Kakchikel community and it's a language he loves. Um, yeah, I want to insert like a note somewhere um, on that as well that um, Bustamante um, produced like the first film ever in the Kakchikel language. Mm. Um, so like he's always been like a purveyor of of Ketchikel and my indigenous culture, um, especially when it comes to the Guatemalan context. Yes, uh, yes, I've read I've read that he has. That's been um, I don't know if the, if a mission to do that is the right word, but he's certainly paid a lot of mind to with his production company, um, representing the indigenous communities in Guatemala as well, and even in in commercial. Um, forms as well which i think is is um, a really fabulous thing that he's doing um but you know to get to this again clashing between classes um it's something that i that i couldn't help but notice throughout the film and pay a lot of attention to um so we you know we we have the sort of upper class between you know the I guess, and it's, it's in a way, it's tied to the generational elements as well. But so we have the so we have the upper class with Enrique and Carmen, and um, you know we 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 see their um, sort of perspective. Um, I think uh, quite specifically, you know, in ways like you know when the ambulance scene plays out. Um, one thing that Carmen. Uh, is worried about in the aftermath when they arrive at the home is oh did anyone steal anything off of me and i thought that was um a really just a, a really nicely placed line there to kind of understand some of the dynamics but um you know this this clashing between classes is a large motif in in uh the full core uh subgenre and it's it's uh, one one thing to point out i think in which um evidences bustamante's approach to using horror it's not it's not the you know I wouldn't say this is the scariest film and it's it I, I don't think it ever, it's trying to be I although I, there are certainly scary things that are happening um, in in this part of history and what it's commenting on but it's not the kind of jump scare horror that perhaps most um, you know uh, moviegoers are used to at least in the United States um, and so I really appreciated the attention to this because you know we we see. Um, a wealthy family living in a, in a sort of mansion or haunted mansion, if you will. But then there's also the servant class who are indigenous people who seem to be living in the home with them and are even seen praying for them. Um, at least the main housekeeper is generally praying for them. And we, we even come to understand further that perhaps she is related to the general himself, which I think is also a fascinating thing to consider in in terms of you know the general's place within you know the the um the things that took place um and how these indigenous people were treated by the military and um you know her place within the home uh you know she and um the daughter natalia's name uh the and and the general's daughter natalia seem to be i don't know if they're a similar age but in in that they're both related and one has the better opportunities, the wealthy position, um, you know, they're a nurse, and as opposed to to that of um, Valeriana, who is the housekeeper, who, um, you know, is essentially a servant. And um, it's, it's just fascinating to me that uh, they're sort of expected to love the family and pray for them and support them, despite the fact that they are these servants. And another, uh, another moment that I wanted to quickly note as well is that um, Natalia's daughter, Sarah, um, at one point in the film in the evening when they're hearing some of just the the music being performed by some of the uh, protesters, just she says, que lindo, which means how pretty when she hears the music from the protests. And I think that also is important to consider that the youngest generation in the household is more, you know, more open-minded, I think, to the protesters. You know, um, Carmen, um, the general's wife, is is kind of more hostile toward them. Um, at least in the start of the film, uh, but um, you know we have then we have the Natalia who seems to be kind of conflicted, and and Sarah herself you know is very interested in Alma who comes into the home later, you know sort of wants to look like her, wants to befriend her, and 
hang out with her and you know again thinks the music from the protesters is even pretty and so i think that's a subtle kind of nod to um what guatemalan people are going through in their perspective of of the um you know atrocities that have taken place and how to view the people who who are victims um because i think it's a very complex thing to consider and you know um the fact that there are different approaches to, to viewing them, I think, is is a, is a great thing that this film tackles with. Yeah, and going off of that um, intergenerationality, um, there's very early in the film, um, Sarah, the granddaughter, um, she asks, why do people say bad things about my grandpa? Um, right. And the family kind of like refuses to offer offer an answer to that beyond like asking her, uh, where like who who was saying these bad things is it your classmates and she kind of responds no I read it on the internet um, and I think that that is a huge um, a huge landmark um, when it comes to like this intergenerationality is that um, Sarah is going up with the internet so when her family like kind of refuses to offer the explanation as to like what why is like the entire country you know rallying with or against or causing trouble like when it comes like the protests outside she can look to the internet for that explanation and actually get um something that is is going to give her the answer and that answer is going to be uh very very tangible as opposed to the the answer that her family would give her which is just that um her grandpa was a politician yeah and not everyone agrees with his policies yeah, and I think that happens multiple times, even when, you know, the, the event later on happens where he's sort of watching Alma in the shower. Um, you know, uh, Sarah, after that, is, is that, uh, wants to know about what happened, and they just tell her to go to sleep. And so I, I agree. It's like there's there's really no hiding at this point in a way, or at least it's, it's easier to learn about things um, for the younger generation as, you know, technology is continuing to evolve. And, um, you know, there are different ways of getting information. Um, I think that speaks to something that I also definitely wanted to touch on in our um, conversation here, which is that this film feels a lot like a documentary to me. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's often a conversation between, you know, the blending of fiction and nonfiction. Um, and I think that this has an interesting way of doing that because first, you know, this is, as we talked about earlier, very much about something that really happened about real, or about a real person in Guatemala's history. And so putting attention to to this kind of these kinds of events in general I think in, in will intrigue people to learn more about and, and perhaps look into okay what really happened um there's that but I I think there's also um I haven't looked into to this as much yet but I, I something I intend to look into is you know the fact that we we see and hear various news reports throughout the film and I think at least a part of me thinks that some of that is is real archival um, content. I, I wonder, maybe it's not, but I, I wonder if, you know, those are um, transcripts that were then reperformed or if they are in fact real, um, you know, uh, reports like at one point, um, the um, Sarah's mother, Natalia, is watching a news report on the television. I wonder if that's real archival footage. Um, you know, but there is this sense nonetheless that um, things are being reported you know um the events of the trial are being reported at one time or the you know just details of the genocide are being uh reported on and and a lot of those details are all accurate and so um there is in in, in a way still just you know offering um uh sort of information on things that definitely did take place and so uh people being informed seems to be um a, a theme throughout the film certainly yeah, and going off of that, um, this the trial of Rios Mont in particular has a very um, interesting and very strong and very uh, tangible connection to film and archival footage in particular. Um, uh, there was a 1983 documentary called When the Mountains Tremble, um, which was a documentary about the war against the Guatemalan military, against the Maya people. Um, and the footage that they collected for that documentary actually ended up being used um, to testify for crimes against humanity against Rios Mont. Um, so it seems to be almost like a connection with like just, just the history of like uh, Guatemalan filmmaking in reference to, to Rios Mont in particular that 
it would make a ton of sense to me if this was archival footage that was being played on the on the television in terms of the news. I have no reason to believe that it's not archival footage, honestly. Um, just with like the the specific intent that it's it's covered and, and placed um, to give you like this sense of timeline that like this is where we are in the trial. Like you hear the the news footage where like they announce that um, the the trial has been has been deemed. Um, like biased and so like we have to retrial and, and the the court case has been annulled like they they give you like all of these these news reports as like as like timestamps so it would be shocking to me if it was not actual archival footage or at least yeah reenacted archival footage one well, and in that i mean it definitely does feel um a lot of it does feel reenacted which you know you could argue is a form of or a mode of documentary in itself um and, and, you know, to add upon that, the importance of the trial scene, um, you know, there are various things that are definitely reenacted, like um, the use of the, um, uh, the Ishil garment, the sort of veil over their faces. Um, we, we see the woman um, testifying with a veil over her face, and then she removes it. And that's something that happened uh, during the real trial. And um, as well as uh, there are other family members and other people from the community wearing the same veil as well. That's, that is something that, in fact, did happen. Also, um, the presence of um, uh, Rigoberta Menchu, who is an, an indigenous feminist and human rights activist and a Nobel Peace Prize winner, um, appears in the film. Um, she's very right at the front uh, during the trial, um, next to pretty much next to, just behind the, the woman testifying, who apparently sat in the same seat that she sat during um, Efrain Rilmont's trial. And so you know like that's another element that seems to be um reenacted or in that just you know sort of to to further emphasize the fact that this is a these are real um issues and these are real things that have happened um also i want to pay attention to to a little bit more of the crafting um in terms of how this film is um experiential um it's, it's another area of film that i i often pay attention to and i was just honestly floored by how this film used experiential um qualities to to um help understand i guess stakes and just i mean i i did read that also you know there was a tight budget with this film and so certain things needed to happen through through sound or you know through some sort of um you know uh one long take sequences but um you know some that i could point to are again the ambulance scene that i mentioned before i i you know that that scene um I've had to rewind and watch several times over because I I, I just loved um, how how we sort of experience with the people inside the ambulance the kind of fear and anxiety that they're going through despite the fact that this man is the guilty one, um, the immoral one. Um, we understand um, the kind of position that they're in in which it seems that, you know, they're really just at a point of like, prayer that they make it safely you know it's it's but it's fascinating the way that they kind of drive through the crowd and we we slowly start to hear more and more people banging on the van on the van and i mean i just i have to say as a person who has spent quite a bit of time um working with sound um boy the way that they use sound in this film to heighten um moments of of i don't know if hostility um or or just you know uh to to un help us understand the the position of these of these characters i think it's just truly beautiful and evocative uh, crafting yeah and i like am not by any means a sound specialist or anything anything like that but to say so like when i say that like i noticed like the sound mixing in a film like that's like wow like the sound mixing in that film's got to be amazing for me to notice it um and i very much like did notice it and it, it was so like it, particularly like with that ambulance scene i think was when i really started to pay attention to the sound mixing of the film because i actually um, thought like I was watching it with my um, balcony door open and I actually thought that there was an ambulance like outside mm -hmm. of my balcony door wow. I had to keep pausing to like see if like that was like and anytime like they honked their horn yeah. um, it sounded like far off enough that like it could actually be like right outside of my window mm -hmm. um, so I had to actually keep pausing to like check and like see like because like the sound mixing was just so realistic on it and then yeah like when um, the protesters start 
um, banging on the um, side of the ambulance and they're trying to like reassure each other like this is this is a peaceful protest this is you know a peaceful yeah. demonstration like there's there's going to be like no violence and then like you're hearing like the the sounds of the of the banging get louder and louder and more and more and it feels like a wave it feels like a tide and i think that like it's very representative of like the shift and like the movement towards like like a push for conviction like a push for justice mm-hmm. and yeah it just feels like this wave of of yeah. like just acknowledgement yes and and furthermore i think also symbolic to the um you know the the haunting nature of the film and how that gradually builds um and and the the sense of hostility between the family and between the protesters and the family how those all things gradually build i think um it's representative of that and where we're headed with the trajectory of the film um what you're pointing to in terms of sound mixing gets to something that i'm quite a stickler for when i watch film personally it's in in how sound perspective is approached because often you know i'm able to pinpoint okay this is this is obviously audio from another take or this is you know something like that and you know, I, I don't know that I've, in, at least in a long time, have experienced anything as respectful of that um, element of filmmaking as this, because, you know, absolutely, that scene is one in particular where it's it's done so well, but also, you know, moments like um, something that I want to get to, as well as the presence of water in the film, and, you know, we we see various times where someone's underwater and what that should sound like with someone else talking outside of the water or other things happening outside, you know, um, it's I, I just want to comment on the fact that yeah sound perspective is um treated very pretty exquisitely and i think um just another nod to the um just the, just the excellence of craft i think when this film that i mean we could also talk about the cinematography which i think is just gorgeous um but uh, that's a whole another uh, episode i think in itself so uh, I, I since i referenced the uh, presence of water i'd like to get to um an area that's important to me, which is um, the um, the presence of folk horror in the film and, and use of its larger motifs. I think, obviously, you know, there's there's the um, mythology that's being used in the film with um, the folktale of La Llorona. So I'll quickly just say, you know, for people who don't know too much about La Llorona, um, her, her folktale is, is essentially depicts a, her as a victim of her lover's betrayal who, after he rejects her, experiences severe grief and, and drowns her children in a river. And so after her own death, she's then compelled to search for them uh, every night. And there are many variations of the folktale. You know, she's often depicted as a beautiful woman who in turn attracts men and they follow her and she leads them to dangerous places um, where they are later found dead. Um, she's depicted as a malevolent, earthbound phantom, you know, this this um, sort of supernatural, um, a supernatural danger. And in, uh, you know, to, to reference a recent um, adaptation of La Llorona, which Alex uh, mentioned, even, um, you know, she, she's been uh, depicted as a demonic, uh, I guess, in a way, which, you know, you could, you know, it's an interesting variation, I guess. Uh, again, that film was not for me either. But, you know, uh, it just is just to speak to the kinds of variations of adaptation of the La Llorona mythology, which, you know, is I, I think in itself is something interesting. But um, this take on on her mythology is quite distinct and fascinating because it's not necessarily her who murdered her children. She is the innocent victim of the general who, who murdered uh, them as well as, as her, we, we come to find out. Um, and so, you know, that in itself, I think the presence of the mythology to further understand um, social issues and political issues and, and class differences and generational differences, um, I, I never expected to get that kind of approach to this mythology, and I I, ha- I can't commend um, Bustamante and his team enough for managing to um, use that to, I think, make this perhaps a more intriguing film for audiences um, to say, oh, this is La Llorona. But, you know, it's 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 not just it's this is a fun, scary film about, you know, a folktale. No, this is this is something much more meaningful than just, you know, uh, folklore sprinkled with horror. It's um it's it's much more dense than that, and I think that's the important takeaway of of understanding La Llorona's place within this film. Do you want to? Do you have anything to say about the La Llorona mythology, Alex? Yeah, I think that the the treatment, just like visually, of La Llorona in this film was just so 
like I, I it just stands out to me like i i it's not often that i watch ghost films at all period um but when you do watch a ghost film especially like if it's a if it's a western ghost film in particular there's certain like apparatuses that they use like they they contort the body or like they make everything look like creepy and dead and decayed exactly. mm-hmm. and and she just looks like life like she looks like life and that's i think part of it as well is is like she is not a demonic force she's not here just attacking people because she's you know a vengeful spirit she's like born out of like a collective community mourning and that community is still alive despite the general's best efforts and that's where i feel like her like like that's where her motivations i feel like are so deeply rooted and the way that she appears as 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 this woman like this this beautiful woman who the general like decides to sexually assault like i i i'm like i'm like constantly like there's just so much about this film and like the way that she appears that i'm like just i can't even begin to wrap my head around like the just element after element of depth that goes into the thought process of this because yeah I, I don't know it goes into like so many different like and to have her dressed all in white as well like she can't wear her maid uniform she has she wears like the addition like the the traditional clothing that she came in with yeah I, <laughs> yeah that's that's beautiful and i have to say a couple of frames that stand out to me are there's one shot of from from an underwater perspective where her hair her long hair is sort of you know in the foreground and and you see these this these these lines of her hair sort of leading up to her face and it's it has this haunting effect um as well as another one that stood out to me is when sarah's blow drying her hair and there's there's a shot in which her hair is blowing toward the frame and i think that's also something of importance to consider in terms of how there are natural elements combined to us our perspective being lured toward her which you know, in itself, it's just, I mean, I don't know if that was the intent or not in, in those in those frames, but boy, do they work for me. I mean, <laughs> um, but, you know, again, to in that, to get to the kind of earthy presence of the film, um, the spiritual, earthy and sensual elements of the film are very much um, important to the full core film in general. And, um, you know, uh, water obviously plays a huge role in, in um, La Llorona's, uh, you know, folktale, but um, it, it is a constant kind of theme throughout the film. You know, we see people holding their breath underwater. Um, the, there's this, there's moments of like heavy kind of fog coming from the pool. Um, attention on the pool comes, you know, scenes of the pool come throughout. Um, Carmen, uh, Enrique's wife, has uh, complains of humidity in her room and then puts eye drops in to kind of suggest this, you know, sort of condensation going on um, in the room and, you know, the kind of earthy, the gradually building earthy involvement in their lives. Um, and, you know, also the frogs, I think, are also important. And in, in when in the climactic scenes in the film with all the frogs, I think it's also suggestive of, you know, what's going on to this family. But um, I also wanted to point something out, too, um, for people who may not know. Uh, so the character we associate as La Llorona in the film, her name is Alma. And um, Alma literally means soul that's what it translates to and um which which in turns uh, i guess means you know it, it suggests the spiritual part of a human being regarded as immortal and that kind of you know gets to your point alex which you just made in which you know these these people are still here the reference is their position as as still fighting for um justice and um that their fight is still ongoing and they're still here um i think that just just a really subtle um and and sort of brilliantly subtle way to kind of suggest wh- what this character is about and wh- what their perspective is. So also the the building violence was something uh, interesting to me. Um, you know, uh, again we at first we we see the or we hear the people banging on the van. You know, um, blood gets tossed inside. That's that's the kind of I think that's the first signs of it that we get. But then um, you know also at the trial there are people sort of uh, calling him a murderer and things like that so it starts vocal it gets a little more hostile from there um, eventually people are throwing things and breaking windows in the in the household and um, I think I think the the haunted house element to this is interesting in that um, you know it's seemingly haunted right like I mean we, we I guess later on it's kind of confirmed that you know these are 
that eventually spirits come to invade. Um, but we don't. I don't know that we totally think of La Llorona as a as a ghost when we when we first meet her. You know what I mean? And I think that that's also a way to kind of you know consider how Bustamante is using this this legend in that it's it's not just it's a ghost and they're gonna jump out and they're gonna look scary no like she's actually quite beautiful and um it's just seems to be just another person coming here to work I mean it, it's kind of suggestive in that they are La Llorona but it's it's we immediately understand that it's a different approach to it and I, I really appreciated that as like not necessarily immediately violent or anything but you know um perhaps with different intentions uh, what did you think of like the haunted house element uh, of the film? Um, not much about the haunted house, but like of her being just like a person. I think that that's. I I wonder almost if that's like a comment on like. This the the kind of person who commits a crime like this, they're not going to be haunted by ghosts. They they don't have like that that sense of of regret or remorse that you know would come with like ghosts that like we would think of in a in a film conception where it's like uh, ghosts always seem to haunt people who have either done something in their past and regretted it or who have like unknowingly and very innocently stumbled into a, a place of of you know, spiritual activity without any kind of know-how and I, I i think that the 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 reason why she's so human at, at least the, the reason that like i interpret it is because like it's not the ghost of his actions is going to be haunting him. It's the fact that there's still people, that that these people are alive, that like the Maya people continue to exist, and the Maya people are going to be the ones that hold him accountable, and that are going to like control essentially the fate of his future with like the way that the trial is going. It's like he's being like actively haunted by like the people. It's 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 not like a revenge story, because like ultimately like unfortunately there there is almost no sense of of vengeance like he dies before you know he can serve like a conviction for the genocide but at the same time like this is this is almost like a like solace almost i i think i think the haunted house element kind of ties into that a little bit as well with like maybe it's not haunted just coincidentally like maybe like it has been cursed maybe you know La Llorona didn't just you know appear out of nowhere maybe she was like sent there very intentionally um and yeah I don't, I don't know. yeah I agree I think I had that thought as well um it's perhaps as you know um some you know uh, a group of the indigenous people perhaps um kind of center there in a way that's that's a fascinating thing to consider and we obviously don't have an answer to that but um I think that's something interesting to just think about as or interpret the film in that way and consider how things play out but I, I have to agree, you know, these people are not, um, w at least from the start of the film, Enrique and, and Carmen both are hold firmly to their beliefs and how they view the uh, protesters and the indigenous community and, you know, seem to want to hold strong to that. And we see them argue with family members. You know, there's that scene when Carmen and Natalia are, are in that large room with all the, you know, chairs around them. And so Carmen says to her, when did you become such a lefty? You know, and it's it's commenting on the fact that this is a very political film and their positions between them are, are highly political and um, there is this sort of expectation from the higher generations within their family to, to say you have to remain loyal you know um, later on Enrique demands respect from Natalia you know um, when she has the gun and so um, I, I have to agree it's I don't know that it, we it, this is a haunted film or, or a haunted house film in, in what we're used to but more so um, suggesting that the position of Enrique and Carmen seem to be, um, you know, uh, I don't know if I want to say beyond help, but um, in that they're going to have to be confronted or hold themselves accountable, you know, by um, to, to what they've done and, and will be confronted by the victims of their um, beliefs and, and, and actions. And we, we see Carmen in particular, her experience in in that kind of haunted presence in which you know she starts to, to have these dreams that each each dream seems to be like i guess this like continued story of, in her dreams and so she's having these dreams that uh you know she puts herself in the position of of alma which we we later find out but you know she's kind of understanding the grief and pain that that they went through and eventually distances herself more and more from enrique and 
eventually what happens happens um but so i think that um you're absolutely right that it's it's a different form of of a haunted house i think and um i appreciate the kind of different responses to what's going on in the home between the two characters uh, who are who seem to be you know the the most affected by the hauntings that are happening there i think that's kind of like um an important little thing too is that like the the film places an emphasis on on women repeatedly um yes. I'm pr- I'm, yeah it's like i'm pretty sure that like the general is really the only main he, I, yeah he is the only male character that has speaking lines oh well, we, we have the the security guy as well oh yeah the security guy he doesn't even have a name right right but, <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so like he he really is kind of like the only so so like this is something that's that's being like reckoned with within um mm-hmm. within matriarchy essentially yes, yes. essentially <laughs> yeah and i mean that that moment does come up where he's uh he sexually assaults um alma and and then carmen uh you know comments on the fact that i didn't think i'd have to be dealing with this at this age you know or at this point in my life still and and so certainly there, there's even that whole you know whole element of the film as well in in terms of you know um betrayal you know but and and as well as um the fact that again valeriana and natalia it seems to be are like half sisters um and uh there's also put in there's questions about who sarah's father is and what happened to him um there's i guess there's suggestions to that but you know we you're absolutely right it is the kind of experience of of women in this that also seems to be of of real importance um we also get a lot of like um ritualism and, and prayer in the film um you know the film opens literally on a group prayer which is symbolic of i think uh, considering who's who the main person praying in that scene is symbolic again of the of that upper class position in the household and, and in the film um you know and and the uh cleansing ritual i also found really interesting in terms of ridding of you know negative forces um but you know in that i mean the negative force that is present, um, I think, is also something of, of you know, um, of debate as well as a topic of debate because, you know, I feel like that can be read in various ways. But um, nonetheless, the the element of ritualism is, is very important to how um, how traditions of, of various cultures um, are present in the film. Um, and so I feel like we could definitely, you know, I think we could do an entire episode on on the crafting in this film and just go scene to scene and kind of talk about, you know, the depth within each and, and how it's using craft to explore these, um, these, these complex themes that are involved. Um, so, you know, maybe we'll, we'll put a, we'll put a hold on that for now, but, you know, to circle back to, um, to Efrain Friosmont and his place within this narrative, um, some interesting things that I wanted to point out that just stood out to me is, you know, as, as suggested, but as it's just interesting are that like, so first he's, he's survived by his, his wife, his son. And I think actually he had two sons. One son was, was killed or, or died, but, and then also a daughter. And so his son is named Enrique actually, um, who is the name of the militant, uh, dictator in this film. And so I think that, again, that's suggests something, um, important who himself served as a chief of staff, but, uh, as an army chief of staff, but resigned after being charged with embezzlement. Um, and his daughter, Zuri, is a former member of Congress who uh, was married to a Republican um, uh, former member of the United States Congress, Gerald Weller. So um, there are connections um, to, to Rios Mont and to um, the uh, sort of Guatemalan uh, dictatorship and like American um, government as well. Um, Alex and I were talking before about um, the Reagan administration's support of uh, Rios, Rios Montt in particular, and um, I don't know, Alex, if you want to like talk about that a little bit, because like I have some I have some facts here, but I think you might have a better grasp on on that connection. Oh, well, sure. Yeah. So um, this largely, okay, so Guatemala Civil War is a very complicated piece of history because it plays a huge part in um the cold war and so like you get a lot of um foreign interventionism into the politics and it's ends up being something that like i'm not sure even nowadays that we have a full grasp on like what secret organization within a government was doing what and where and when 
um what we do know is like we have like a very strong um we do have like very strong like evidence of what the u.s was doing in guatemala at the time um because of it was just very transparent um in these operations um because rios mods was um installed um as someone who was who was anti-leftist anti-communist and said the u.s wanted to support that regime um for the purposes of you know not allowing the soviet union to take a foothold in latin america um i believe that the united states just recently lost cuba uh prior to to guatemala um so the u.s is, is working with cuba at the same time between the, the batista and um uh castro uh revolutionary conflict there um so like what what ends up happening is that like it's just due to Mont's like staunch anti-communism um like the reagan the reagan administration was like very supportive of Mont's positioning um and this was also despite the fact that um we knew we as in like global um center century like we knew that uh rios Mont was targeting the my indigenous community um this is this is the 80s like it's not that long ago like there is you know videographic evidence um there were a lot of documentary crews um on site at the time a lot of television crews that caught a a lot like a substantial amount of what the military was doing um and despite this um the reagan administration um you know he claimed that the human rights conditions were improving under Mont because um, Mont's um, previous, uh, prior, the, the, the previous leader of Guatemala, who I cannot remember who was right before Mont, um, was also committing genocide. Like, this was like a series of attacks against Maya people that it escalated over time with Mont being the worst exponentially out of um, any of the previous rulers. Um, so, like, the Reagan administration, like, praises um, Guatemala's human rights conditions under Mont um, and ends up shipping a lot of military hardware to Mont um, under the, the premise that Mont was going to use this to continue to fight off um, communist insurgents. Right. I think they lift Carter's administration's embargo on um, their, their arms embargo um, because of human rights violations. Yeah, and it was intentionally done without the U.S. Congress's permission. Uh, Reagan shipped these weapons without permission of the Congress, um, which was it's, it, which was important for the um, whole you know trials surrounding uh, Reagan as well. Um, and, and it wasn't just um, it was it wasn't just the Reagan administration either. Uh, Israel had also been very um, proactive um, in not just shipping arms, but also in intentionally training um Mont's troops um a lot of Mont's military actually was sent out to israel to train in israel with the israeli government officials um and the israeli uh military and then were sent back to guatemala um so it, it's 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 very complex um it has like a huge like i mean and we're still seeing like the consequences of this today i mean we we know how many people were killed roughly we don't have like a hardline statistic of how many people died, and we definitely do not have a hardline statistic of how many people were displaced. Um, but you know, you can judge based on like modern immigration patterns that, you know, this is a genocide that leads to mass migration. So yes, exactly, and and I think um, there's yeah, there's something that I I have read about is the um, more northern parts of Guatemala that seem to want to get into the southern parts of Mexico, and that. Um, and and I think something else to, to take away is, um, you know, it seems that his sort of initial, like, um, promise was, you know, to return Guatemala to some sort of, like, authentic, like, democracy, um, which I think pretty clearly proves um, an empty promise. Um, and so, you know, then this, yeah, as we, as we say, this civil war between the Guatemalan army and, and leftist guerrillas, I mean, last well beyond, I would say, two decades, would you say? I mean, I, I think, yeah, there is this sort of widespread um, fear um, that that does in, in, uh, effectively remove, um, you know, these indigenous um, communities from Guatemala away. And I think, you know, some of this feels 
as we continue to talk about this feels quite relevant um, in some ways to what we're experiencing here and so again i, I think that this is a an important film right now for anyone to watch um but I, I certainly think that it deserves more attention here um well alex i think there is so much that we could talk about with this film um and we could go on and on unfortunately um i think we'll have to cut it off there um so uh you know i just like to you know thank you for attempting to tackle this with me um in a in a shorter period of time um um, but you know i i really truly enjoy talking about this and i'm sure we'll you know between us talk about it more but um yeah thank you for for joining me on this uh conversation thank you for um, having me yeah of course and so um well, that that about does it for our show this week. So we hope you all enjoyed the conversation. And whether you're a returning listener or if this is your first time with us, we appreciate you tuning into the show. Please subscribe to the show on Anchor, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And please spread the word. You can follow us on Instagram at Cineposium and on Twitter at Cposium to keep up with updates and to keep in communication with us. If you're interested in subscribing to a weekly e-newsletter, please email us at cineposium.ucla at gmail.com. Thank you all again for listening. Until next week, take care, everyone.